Many of you uh, have no doubt heard about online learning. Uh, some of you perhaps have participated in online learning. Perhaps some of you are, are taking online courses yourselves or participating in the delivery of online courses. Online learning has really jumped to the fore over the last year or so for a variety of reasons, not least uh, that universities are starting to feel the pressure for online learning, not only the pressure to provide online learning, but pressure from competitive uh, commercial providers of online education, and they're starting to get worried about it. So online learning is much in the news. We do, it's kind of a big secret around here, but we actually do a lot of teaching. Uh, those of you who are involved in the teaching know that we do a lot of teaching. Uh, and uh, if we're going to do more of it, and we, and we aspire as an institution to do more of it, then we're going to need to get involved in online learning because although not everything is going, to, not all learning is going to take place online in the future, a good bit of it is. Uh, how much, what, what proportion remains to be seen. So what I'm going to try to do quite briefly here is to talk about these questions. What is it? Uh, who does it? Uh, what does it cost? And what does it mean for us? Uh, those are the simple questions. The, uh, the more complicated questions is, uh, are the, can we do it as an institution? Should we do it? Can we afford not to do it? And uh, where are we going to get the time to do it? And all of those quite serious questions, especially given all of the other good ideas that have been discussed so far uh, in, the, um, in the symposium today. Uh, so a lot of interest in online learning, a lot of reports being issued both in the UK and the US and indeed in the EU, two of the more prominent reports. Yeah, I've got my got my pointer uh, in my pocket. There we are. Two of the more prominent reports, this Avalanche report, which is commissioned by the UK, by the UK government, and uh, this, uh, this article that appeared in Nature magazine, Waldrop, uh, talking about the coming revolution in online learning that everyone is going to have to get involved with in one way, shape, or form. I commend both of these articles to you if you, if you don't have, if you haven't read them. They have a lot to say about the state of learning, especially postgraduate education, undergraduate and postgraduate education all by itself, and how online learning is going to be able to meet some of the uh, deficiencies uh, in postgraduate and, uh, and in undergraduate education. So if, if any of you would like copies of these, please contact me and I'd be happy to give you electronic copies. Uh, the, uh, the European Union is getting involved in this. E-learning needs to be seen as part of a larger effort to modernize uh, education and indeed to cope in an educational sense with the communications revolution that is revolutionizing so many of our fields all the way from core scientific research to, uh, to public uh, engagement. So this is part of a larger effort uh, to modernize uh, and to take advantage of the, uh, of the electronic communications revolution in the educational context. Now, e-learning goes by a variety of different monkeyers, all of these acronyms. They, people love acronyms around here, so I thought I'd corner the market on acronyms. Uh, and there, this is just a small sample of acronyms that uh, relate to uh, the e-learning initiative. But all of these different things are e-learning, all the way from just uh, putting things up on the web to, um, to, vir to creation of virtual learning environments. Uh, if you can get involved in as simple a context or as complicated a context as you want, lots of scope for creativity, both at the individual and the institutional level uh, in this field. Uh, my definition, my personal definition of online learning, I don't expect anybody to, uh, to agree with this definition or to, uh, to use it as their personal definition, but it's delivery of learning content and instruction in whole or in part remotely using internet technology. And almost all of those other acronyms do this to some way, shape, or form. Uh, the, uh, the advantages of benefits of, e uh, of online learning have been much discussed, and these are just a small selection. Certainly, the, uh, we, are able, we would be able to reach a greater number of students and a greater diversity of students through an online offer than we ever could through a face-to-face -face offer, especially given the limited facilities that we have here on site at South Kensington, not to mention Tring or some of the other places where we conduct education. Uh, so there's a potential to reach a greater, greater variety of students, a greater, greater, and a greater variety of students at all levels of education, all the way from the very basic level up to the most advanced uh, ongoing continual pro professional training. In addition, online learning accommodates a greater diversity of learning and learning styles, not just the passive uh, lecturing, uh, the passive acquisition of information through lecturing, but uh, all the way from 
lecturing and demonstrations and laboratory projects and data analysis, all the way to uh, to the uh, community networking and some of the uh, and crowdsourcing and some of the uh, some of the other aspects of um, of involvement that we've um, uh, that we've seen here. Also, the e-learning has a very cost-efficient business model. That should probably be in quotes because there is some. There's cost efficiency and there's cost efficiency in terms of these educational business models, as I'll come on to in just a moment. But there are issues. There are infrastructural issues uh, in the fact that we need a totally different approach to uh, service-oriented uh, in uh, IT provision, IT service provision, or customer-oriented IT service provision than we've been operating with, at least here in the museum, uh, up to this point. There's a high initial cost for IT infrastructure uh, and IT expertise. Uh, that needs to be part. You can't sort of work, feel your way through online learning. Given the competition that's out, out, out there, you've got to deliver a professional service from the word go. Some topics don't lend themselves to an e-learning approach, uh, although this is an area that I'd hope we'd explore. You would think that a uh, collections-based organization like this would be one of the last sort of institutions that would adopt an e-learning approach. But in conjunction with the collections digitization project, then I think there's a lot of scope for us to really lead the field in terms of getting our work out there, getting our collections out there, getting our information out there in an electronic way. And, um, uh, and then there are some large online courses, and I'll talk about these in just a moment, uh, MOOCs that exhibit extraordinarily high dropout rates. Uh, probably you've heard of these MOOCs. These are massive open online courses that have caused universities to rethink some, of their, some aspects of their, of their business model. Lots of people like MOOCs, in fact, so much so that they've started up their own companies, commercial companies, to deliver MOOCs that they think are going to drive large numbers of universities out of business. Uh, a lot of people also have some serious questions about the, uh, the whole MOOC design. Um, these are some of the companies, some of the commercial companies that are, have been set up to deliver these massive online courses. Uh, the one in the UK that's going to lead the field, although it's just getting started right now, is FutureLearn here in which 21, uh, the British Council, British Library, British Council, British Museum, and 21 top UK in institutions are joining together to deliver a, a MOOC-like offer that will compete with some of these more commercial uh, uh, organizations, commercial companies, all of which are based in the US. MOOCs are part of the distance learning and open education resource movement, so they're, the MOOCs are not all of e-learning. Uh, they've attracted attention. Uh, their concerns abound, abound, however, with respect to the, uh, the delivery of MOOCs. And here's just a, a bit of data here uh, for a bioelectricity MOOC that was delivered by Duke University. Of the 12,000 people that signed up, only three, 300 actually, took, uh, actually completed the course. So that's not the sort of model that we would like to emulate. Uh, what, we'd, what we'd rather do in the context of our institution would be to go for more boutique courses that have smaller numbers and more specialist, and that's pretty much the audience that we typically speak to uh, uh, generally, uh, generally. We'd like to adopt something like what the University of Manchester has done with its Egyptology course, and I'll let uh, Joyce Tildesley here tell you about the Egyptology course at Manchester. I'm Joyce Tildesley. I teach and write many of the online courses in Egyptology. As you can see from the flyer here, we offer several courses. We have a certificate in Egyptology program, which is a three-year online course providing the opportunity for the serious academic study of ancient Egypt. We have a continuation of this, or an extension, the Diploma in Egyptology, which provides, it's two years long, and it provides for more in-depth, serious academic study of Egyptology. And we also run short courses in Egyptology. These are the ones that I think this we should emulate. These are six emulate. weeks long. They're non-credit bearing courses. And we run a variety of topics simultaneously. For example, I've just put a few examples here. Queens of Ancient Egypt, Warfare and Weapons, Gods and Goddesses, Tutankhamun. And we add to these subjects on a regular basis. We'll move on quite quickly here. Joyce has, uh, has developed a model of, uh, of the delivery of these boutique courses in Egyptology, which is not a million miles away from the sorts of things that we do, that delivers to the University of Manchester and to her program. On a, she, she only does this part-time, but delivers 30,000 pounds per year to that program. That's just one person's effort. Uh, if we were to go into this uh, on, a, on a large basis here, these are just for, from one course a year, doing three courses, either giving the course one course a year or three courses a year. These, this is the type of net income that we might be looking at. And that's just using 1% of the, 
of the a part time part time of one percent of the staff resource that we have available to us at the NHM. There are a number of different topics that were very popular topics, much more popular than Egyptology, I would argue, that we could offer uh, in the in this way. And if we involve a significant percentage of the uh, of the staff in these types of courses and the delivery of these types of courses, and that's part time, a minority of your time. Uh, then we can realize uh, a, 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 a very large revenue for the museum. There's a growth market here. That M stands for million. So uh, I'd like to thank you for your time. This is something that's going to come. We have approval to, to do a, an experiment with three courses over the next three years. You'll be hearing more about these. But if anyone would like to talk to me about uh, delivering or participating or supporting online education, then please contact me uh, outside of this meeting. Thank you. Thanks, Norm. Does, does anybody have a very quick one, very quick question? One liner. One liner, Vince. <laughs> so what wouldn't work? Okay, so so Vince's question is, what wouldn't work as an online course? <laughs> Sorry, Vince. <laughs> um, what wouldn't work as an well? The, the uh, online courses are in the, are in their formative stages, so so it, it all it's all it's all open to play to play for. One thing that wouldn't work possibly is um, uh, a uh, some sort of field field experience where you actually have to go out and dig dig things yourself and confront the problems there. So that might be a limitation. Although you could prepare for a field trip using online, but that's just uh, uh, an example that happens to come to mind. Great. Thank you very much, Norm.